Asato ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mrityor ma amritam gamaya, om shanti shanti shanti. Om, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's class with the title, Much Ado About Clay Pots. This is the, for those of you who are regulars or who are not, this is the fifth class in a series that I started last year here in Hollywood. The series is... Um, it involves reinterpreting the Vedantic scriptures in the light of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. I give three classes on the Isha Upanishad, discussing the Isha Upanishad in a new light, using Sri Aurobindo's commentary and using the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. And then I taught a class more recently called The Tale of Two Birds. Can you guess which Upanishad that's about? Mundaka, very, yes, very good, exactly. Mundaka Upanishad, the tale about the two birds. And this one is the fifth in the series. Much ado about clay pots. So I think because I gave you the handout, it's no longer uh, difficult to guess which Upanishad we're talking about today. It's the Chandogya Upanishad. But before we do, I thought I would just um, remind you of why I'm engaging in this project in, this fir in the first place, why we are engaging in this project in the first place. Why should we reinterpret the scriptures? They've already been interpreted many times over by some of the greatest acharyas, greatest thinkers that ever lived. Why do we need to reinterpret the scriptures? Swami Vivekananda gives the answer. I'm reading you a statement, a very important statement he made. It's in the complete works, volume seven, the references in the handout. It's the first statement in the handout. But one thing I didn't mention in the handout is orig originally it, this, this statement comes from a rule book for monks, which is not public. And it's not, the whole thing is not in the complete works, but they pulled out this part from this rule book for monks and uh, put it in the complete works. It's extremely important. Just imagine, you have to appreciate the importance of the fact that it's not just a public lecture he's giving. He dictated word for word in the original, the original was in Bengali for the rule book for the monks. And so this is how he wanted monks especially to study the scriptures and teach these scriptures to the rest of the world actually. So let me read it to you. Please follow along, first passage. We must interpret the Vedas in the light of the experience of Sri Ramakrishna. Shankaracharya and all other commentators made the tremendous mistake to think that the whole of the Vedas say only one thing. Therefore, they were guilty of torturing those of the apparently conflicting Vedic texts, which go against their own doctrines, into the meaning of their particular schools. No one can truly understand the Vedas and Vedanta unless one studies them in the light of the utterance of Sri Ramakrishna. An extremely significant statement about how we should interpret the scriptures. He says, Swami Vivekananda says, there have already been great commentaries, but it's time for a new one. In the light of Sri Ramakrishna, the great life and the great teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. He says elsewhere, along the same lines, that we should interpret the Vedantic scriptures, quote, on an independent and better basis than by blindly following the commentators. We should interpret these scriptures on an independent and better basis than by blindly following the commentators. So taking these two statements as our lead, what I'd like to do today with all of you is to discuss, examine carefully some very important mantras from the Chandogya Upanishad that concern the relationship between Brahman 
and this world of names and forms. And I want to accomplish four things here, together with the rest of you. First, I'll be, we'll be reading together these mantras. Secondly, before we get into any of the interpretations by commentators and all that, we'll do a kind of naive reading. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, about what I mean by that. <clears throat> a reading untainted by any of the kind of uh, existing commentaries. Next step will be, we will then respectfully and rever reverentially study some of the traditional commentaries on these mantras, specifically by Shankara, Ramanuja, and Madhva. And if we're really followers of Swamiji, we should try to follow him and his advice, which is that we should be bold enough to point out text torturing of any of these acharyas when we feel it's necessary, when we think that, wait a minute, they're really bending the scriptural verse here to suit their own philosophies. And finally, last but not least, I want to, we should discuss what new light can be shed on these great mantras from the Chandogya Upanishad if we reinterpret them in the light of the life and teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. So it's a lot to cover. And at the same time, I'm somehow trying to make this interactive. So my request is, when I ask you a question, try to keep your responses succinct and to the point, so that, uh, because there's a lot of material to cover as well. OK, so Chandogya Upanishad, one of the oldest Upanishads, one of the most important. 6.1.3 to 6.1.6. 6. These are the four mantras that we'll be discussing today. So, uh, to give you a little context, there's a, a young boy named Shweta Ketu. He studies the Vedas under a guru in a traditional Gurukula system long back. This is ancient India. And as a result, he becomes puffed up with pride. He becomes egoistic. He's a know-it-all. And this know-it-all kid comes back to his father and starts bragging to him about how much he knows. And then his father says, OK, you've told me a lot of things, but you haven't learned the most essential thing. And then we begin with this third mantra from 6.1. So this is what the father says, Shweta Ketu's father. Yena shutam shutam bhavati. Amatam madam avigyatam vigyatam iti. Katham nu bhagavaha sa adesho bhavati iti. That teaching by which what is never heard becomes heard, what is never thought of becomes thought of, what is never known becomes known. And then Shweta Ketu, after hearing this intriguing question from his father, says, So give me the answer to this riddle. What is that teaching? And then these very, very famous mantras follow which I'll, I'll read uh, consecutively because they're all, you'll see that they're all syntactically related and related in terms of content as well. Yatha somyaikena mritpindena sarvam mrinmayam vigyatam syat vacharambanam vikaro namadheyam mrittika iti eva satyam. O somya, it is like this. By knowing a single lump of earth, you know all objects made of earth. All transformation has speech as its basis and is called by a name, and is called a name. But earth is the reality. Next mantra. Yatha somyaikena lohamanina sarvam lohamayam vigyatam syad vacharambanam vikaro namadhyam loham iti eva satyam. O somya, it is like this by knowing a single lump of gold. You know all objects made of gold. All transformation has speech as its basis and is called a name. But gold is the reality. And sixth. Yatha somyaikena naka nikrintanena sarvam karshnayasam vigyatam syad vacharambanam vikaro namadheyam krishnayasam iti eva satyam evam sam Evam somya sa adesho bhavati iti. O somya, it is like this. By knowing a single nail cutter, you know all objects made of iron. Assuming it's an iron nail cutter. 
All transformation has speech as its basis and is called a name. But iron is the reality. O Somya, this is the teaching I spoke of. Okay, so as I promised, the first thing I want to do is do a kind of naive prima facie reading, which means without encountering any interpretations or commentaries, we've all just read these mantras together. Granted, not in the context of the, the entire Upanishad, which is massive and it would take probably several semesters, yeah. It's a little opaque. I have mm. no idea what you mean. You need a mic in order for people online to hear you. Yeah, so please use it. Is it okay if I ask this question? Yeah. It says all transformation has a, has speech as its basis. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what transformation means in this context. Okay. And is called a name. Okay, it's called a name I sort of get, but I have no idea what all transformation has speech as its basis, what that okay, means. Okay, good. So why don't we ask the whole, everybody who's here. Are there any, are we out of handouts or? Yeah. We have some. Okay, why don't we, we can just, yeah, put them there. Otherwise, you're going to have to get up all the time, right? Oh, no, it's you. No, no, you keep yours. You don't have to give yours. <laughs> If she could, she was, could share with her neighbor. Okay, all right, okay. So there's one extra, you can give it to somebody who doesn't have it. Um, right, so anybody, take a stab at Kenny's question, which is, what exactly is meant by transformation? What does it mean for transformation to have speech as its basis? Yes, uh, Kiran. I assume it's like the forms that material can take. So wood can be a chair or a table or something else. Very good, exactly, exactly, I think that's right. I mean, from the same wood, you can make a table out of it, you can make a chair out of it. You notice how I just used two different words to describe these two different forms of the wood, right? One is chair, one is table. So, at least we're moving, so we're not gonna, so the thing is, the moment you get into like deeper explanations or more specific explanations, you, you end up giving an interpretation. And so the part of the, what I'm, I'm doing is working toward kind of considering different interpretations, but it's very good that you asked the question. But let's, let's stick with this for now because we've got a lot to cover and we want to get through four different interpretations of, this, of, this, of these four mantras. But let me, before that, another aspect of the naive approach, naive reading. What do you make of the metaphors? See, remember the context, which is Shweta Ketu, arrogant, know-it-all, says, I know everything in the Vedas. And then his father says, but you don't know its most essential teaching, which explains how you can know that, that which can never be heard through what is heard, how you can know that which can never be seen through what is seen, and, and so on and so forth. So in that context, now let me ask you the question again. What is the significance of or meaning of these metaphors that are used, very expressive metaphors, clay and objects made out of clay, gold and ornaments made out of gold, especially let's focus on these two. There's a nail cutter one, which is I think less interesting, but these two. So any, any stabs, anyone wanna take a stab? Remember the question is, basically what the father's talking about is, how does this world relate to Brahman? That's the fundamental question that he's answering in these mantras. Yeah, uh, but give the mic, please. Um, well, like syntactically, the way that... It doesn't seem to be working, the mic. Right? Or, hold on. Um, based on the way... That. Yes. Uh, okay. Say it again, please. Okay. So just looking at like the syntax and the way that um, each statement is following like the same formula mm -hmm. leads me to think about how, you know, clay would usually be thought of as like pretty mundane and like not super valuable. Mm -hmm. And then gold is like a very high value. Mm -hmm. And by phrasing these statements in the same way, it's like, showing that there's no distinction between clay and gold mm. and that um, like everything is equally divine. That's very interesting. This is like, it's like you're combining aspects of Sri Ramakrishna who said mati taka takamati, this like golden coin and, and clay. And also 
We're going to find out in a minute, once I get to Madhva's commentary, that Madhva um, also notes a difference between gold, which is extremely valuable, and other substances. But we'll get to that. Thank you. Good. So let's dive in now into some of these traditional commentaries. First, I'll discuss Shankara's. All of these, all too briefly. Shankara, then Ramanuja, then Madhva, and then we'll discuss them, and then we'll get to Sri Ramakrishna, hopefully. Okay, so Shankara's interpretation first. To appreciate his interpretation, to understand it properly, we need to have some understanding of his philosophy. Hopefully, most of you know something about it, but the basic formula in Sanskrit is Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya Jivo Brahmaiva Naparaha. Non dual pure consciousness, Brahman alone is real. This entire world of names and forms is ultimately non existent. It doesn't actually exist from the ultimate standpoint. Jivo Brahma Vinaparaha means, and you, in your deepest essence, are identical with that non dual pure consciousness. That's the whole of Advaita Vedanta philosophy of Shankara and his followers. So now, but what does that mean? What does that mean for all these things, like I'm talking to you now? What about the table? What about the laptop? And so many other things. Shankara says, they're all real from the empirical standpoint, the Vyavaharika standpoint, but not from the Paramatika standpoint, the ultimate standpoint. He says that this entire world, each of us as individual souls, and even the personal God, Saguna Brahman, all of these are only real from the empirical standpoint, but, and the empirical standpoint amounts to the standpoint of ignorance. Ignorance of what? Of Brahman. So long as we remain ignorant of the highest reality, we think of this world as real, we, we worship a personal God, we think of ourselves as different from each other, but when we realize Brahman, what happens? Everything vanishes. It was never there to begin with, so even vanishing isn't, the right, isn't quite right. You realize it never was. None of this ever was. That's Advaita Vedanta. So that's, the, that's, now, so that's the basic philosophy. Now, when it comes to this question of explaining the relationship between Brahman and this world, what is Shankara's answer? I've already given you enough to figure it out, but um, I'll just tell you now. The doctrine is called Vivartavada, which is the doctrine of illusory transformation, or illu illusory appearance, we can say. So the idea is, this world is nothing but an illusory appearance of Brahman. And he was very fond of a particular metaphor. Not clay and pots, but rope and snake. These are, it's a very common metaphor in the Advaita Vedanta literature. He says, just as a rope is mistaken, can be mistaken as a snake, just so Brahman, non-dual pure consciousness, is mistaken in our state of ignorance. For what? This world of names and forms, okay? So keep all this in mind. Um, oh, and the other thing, I have to give you a little bit more background before we dive into the commentaries. Because this class is, we're gonna be making much ado of clay pots. And uh, here's what's relevant, to understand all three of the traditional commentaries. I'm gonna bring in a simple example. Imagine there's a mound of clay. And there's a potter who's an expert in making things out of the clay, okay? Let's imagine that this potter makes a beautiful pot out of this mound of clay. There are two kinds of causality, two kinds of cause in Indian philosophy, also in Western philosophy. Aristotle has similar ideas. One is called instrumental cause. So if I were to ask you, who or what is the instrumental cause of this beautiful clay pot, what would the answer be? Does anyone know? It's, it's a sort of technical philosophy. The instrumental cause of the clay pot is the potter himself or herself. It's the, it's the creator, the agent, the conscious agent who creates, who fashions something out of the raw material. But there's a different kind of cause called material cause. Can you guess what the material cause of the same beautiful clay pot is? Clay. Exactly, it's the clay. Clay is the material cause of the clay pot. The potter is the instrumental cause of the same clay pot. 
keep these two terms in mind because it's very important. Each one of these great acharyas is going to give a different answer to this fundamental question. What is the relation between Brahman and the world? And if there is a causal relation, is Brahman the instrumental cause of this world? Is Brahman the material cause of the world? Or is Brahman both the instrumental cause and the material cause of the world? Or is Brahman neither the instrumental cause nor the material cause of the world? These are already four different possibilities here. There are probably more. But anyway. So now, now we get to Shankara's interpretation with all this in the background. He says, this is exactly what puzzled Kenny. It also, it didn't puzzle Shankara. He was actually, he was happy about it. And he gives it a very interesting spin, the statement that you brought up, vacharam manam namadeya, which is that um, all transformation has speech as its basis and is called a name. Shankara has a field day with this, and he says, uh, this is a quotation, a direct quotation from his commentary. He says, transformation is only a name <clears throat> dependent merely on speech. Apart from that, there is no substance called transformation. In reality, earth as such ultimately exists. So he's giving a very strongly illusionistic interpretation of the statement that you asked the question about, which is all these names and forms you see in this world are ultimately illusory. They're just given different names, but there's no substance behind it. There's no substance behind anything, any of these names and forms we're seeing here. Because everything is ultimately illusory. The only reality is non-dual pure consciousness. So in reality, earth as such ultimately exists. That earth, that clay, the gold, that's Brahman, right? It corresponds to Brahman. <clears throat> and all the different the ornaments you can make out of gold, all the different kinds of things like pots and whatever elephants that you can make out of clay, those correspond to all the different names and forms in this world. They don't even exist from the ultimate standpoint, according to Shankara. But Shankara is a smart, smart man. He's a great philosopher, a realized soul. And so he raises a natural objection. He says, but this is very tr uh, common in traditional commentaries. They, they have a purapaksha position, which means they themselves, the commentator comes up with potential objections to their view and then responds to them. So one of these potential objections is, but wait a minute. This metaphor of clay and pots, this metaphor of golden ornaments, do these, do these metaphors really lend themselves to an, to an illusionistic interpretation? What's the problem? The problem is, is it plausible to say that this clay pot is an illusory appearance of the clay? Is it plausible to say that gold earrings or a gold necklace are illusory appearances of gold? Or is it more plausible to say that the gold earrings are a real manifestation of gold, real but temporary, right? It's not going to last forever. Ultimately, it'll go back into its maybe primordial form or who knows what's going to happen to it in the future. The earrings won't last forever. The clay pot won't last forever, right? But the idea in the metaphor is that the clay is what's enduring. But the clay pots are just as real as the clay. The golden ornaments are just as real as the gold. That's what the metaphor seemed to imply. This is Shankara's Purapaksha position, which means the objector. So uh, in, the objector asks this question. This is a quote from Shankara. How can the changeless and partless Brahman have changeful configurations? Because that's a lesson that seems to be drawn from these metaphors. Just as, you can, just as uh, different pots can, be, can come out of the same clay, different ornaments can come out of the same gold, just so this entire world of names and forms comes out of Brahman. But if that's true, Brahman actually transforms into all these different names and forms that we see around us. That's the question. And that doesn't agree with Shankara's interpretation. So what does Shankara say? Don't overread these metaphors. That's his, that's his answer. He says, don't take these metaphors too seriously and don't push them too far. He says, the better metaphor, now I'm paraphrasing, he doesn't say the better metaphor, but the one he prefers is rope snake. Why? Because it lends itself so well to his illusionistic interpretation, of course, right? And, he's, and so he, he brings in this rope snake analogy at this point. And he says that we should understand these metaphors as really in terms of the rope and the snake. So he'd be aligning this world of names and forms with the snake, and the clay pots, essentially, would be like the snake 
the illusory appearance of what? The rope, which corresponds to the clay at the basis of all these pots, or the gold at the basis of all the different golden ornaments. Okay? So, now, first of all, I'm d debating whether I should ask the question now or should we go through the other two interpretations before. Let me go through Ramanuja and Madhva before, because otherwise I think we're going to run out of time. So, that's Shankara's interpretation. If you have questions, you can ask me later. Second great commentator, Ramanuja, the great Vishishta Dvaita Vedantan, he, he, uh, he belonged to one of the many bhakti schools of Vedanta, which means devotional schools, which believe in worship of the personal God. And so for Ramanuja, Brahman is not non-dual pure consciousness, it's Vishnu Narayana, the personal God, who creates, preserves, and destroys this world, who responds to our prayers, who is perfectly loving, omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient, and so on. And then, he, he asks, what is the relation between Brahman, understood as Vishnu Narayana, so let's now just say Vishnu Narayana, so as not to confuse ourselves. What is the relation between Vishnu and this world? And he gives a beautiful metaphor. He says that this world is nothing but the body of Vishnu, Sharida in Sanskrit. The world is the body of Vishnu. And he supports the doctrine of Parinamavada, which is the exact opposite of Shankara's Vivartavada. Vivartavada, remember, Shankara's doctrine is the doctrine that this world is, is an, only an illusory appearance of Brahman. Brahman might appear to have transformed into this world, but in reality it, it has not. There's only Brahman. All along there's been only Brahman. No world. Ramanuja says, no, Parinamavada is the correct view. Parinama means transformation. It's the doctrine of real transformation. Brahman actually transforms into this world, everything in this world. And so now going back to why I gave you those two technical terms before, instrumental cause and material cause, according to Ramanuja, Brahman is both the instrumental cause of this world, instrumental cause meaning like the potter is the instrumental cause of clay pots, but Brahman is equally the material cause of this world, which means God actually in one aspect, is this world. It's his body, in a very strong sense, okay? By contrast, what is Shankara's position? Shankara's position is that Brahman appears to be the instrumental cause of this world, and Brahman appears to be the material cause of this world. He grants that much. But why does it appear to be, to, to be both these things? Because we're ignorant of Brahman. So when we realize the truth, which is non-dual pure consciousness, which is our essence, what happens? We realize that this world never was, and that Brahman actually never transformed at all, which means that from the ultimate standpoint, according to Shankara, Brahman is neither the instrumental cause of this world nor the material cause. That's Shankara's position. Ramanuja is the exact opposite. Brahman is both the instrumental cause of this world and the material cause of the world. So we already have now two different, completely different answers to the same question. How is Brahman related to this world? Let me read to you from Ramanuja's Vedarta Sangraha, where he talks about this Chandogya Upanishad verse. He says, out of its causal state, he's referring to Vishnu now, in which the sentient and non-sentient beings, chit and achit, form its body in their subtle condition. Undifferentiated in name and form, Brahman, meaning Vishnu, through his own will, because he's the personal God, through his own will, passes playfully into the state of the effect and comes to possess the limitless and diversified world of moving and non-moving beings as its own configuration. This is very technical. I'm gonna just try to simplify it a little. The idea is that this world always exists, either in the latent state, in seed form. Sri Ramakrishna used to liken it to these uh, uh, little, uh, like seeds almost. So it's like that, the universe in its seed state. And then there's the same universe manifest as this world of names and forms. So you can guess that we're currently in the manifested form of, the, of this world, right? 
And so there's constantly contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion. Right now we're in the expanded form, the manifest form. Eventually, the big crunch, it's going to contract back into seed form. And all along, this world, whether it's in the latent state or in the manifest state, is nothing but the body of Vishnu. Is one with Vishnu, actually. It's an aspect of Vishnu. All the sentient beings, you're all sentient beings, I hope, no, no robots in the room. That's Chit. So the position is called Vishishtadvaita Vedanta because it's Brahman, Vishnu, qualified by Chit and Achit. Chit means sentient beings, so all of you, all of us. And Achit means insentient entities, chairs and tables and all these things. But Vishnu is everything. And this entire world of insentient entities and sentient beings is nothing but Vishnu's body. This is the background. So now, Ramanuja is delighted with the same metaphors that pose a problem for Shankara, because he thinks that this clay in pots from this Chandogu Upanishad, golden ornaments, lends itself perfectly to the Vishtadvaitic interpretation, which is that God has actually become everything in this world, just as clay becomes different clay pots, just as gold becomes, transforms into, really transforms into golden earrings and golden necklace. So Ramanuja says the following. The same substance, clay, in a part of itself, becomes modified into a multitude of forms and conditions and acquires a multitude of names for serving different practical purposes. Again, we come back to Kenny's question from the beginning. Even then, these different products being nothing other than particular forms of clay, the original substance, clay itself, exists in these several conditions. The products are not entities other than clay. All of the different products of clay that we can imagine, whether it's clay pots or clay spoons or whatever they are, they're nothing but clay, but that doesn't make, make the forms unreal. That's Ramanuja's point here. They're fully real. The clay pot is as real as a clay, even if it's nothing but clay. That's the idea. In the same way, this world is nothing but Vishnu, but in a particular form. And Vishnu remains perfect and pristine in, in his essence as the personal God. That's also important. Because one big question is, well, this world is full of evil. Doesn't that implicate God, who is the material cause of this world? So the evil that you find in the world is also somehow part of Vishnu's evil. And what Ramanuja does is, I'm not going to get into details here, I'm giving you a, a gist. He distinguishes Vishnu's essence, his swarupa, from his manifestations. And he says that this world is a manifestation. It's a real manifestation of Vishnu. But that doesn't touch his essence, which remains completely perfect and unaffected by all the evil that we see in the world. So you might probe that and say, that doesn't satisfy me for these reasons, but we're not going to go into it. That would be a different class. OK, and uh, this question that Kenny raised about, so what, what, how does Ramanuja understand that all transformation has speech as its basis. The idea is this, not like Shankara, Ramanuja rejects Shankara's interpretation. Shankara says again what? All these names and forms are nothing but names. There's actually no substance behind it. They're not real as names and forms. Ramanuja says they're perfectly real as names and forms, but their ultimate reality is Brahman, Vishnu. They're nothing but Vishnu's body, but they're fully real manifestations of Vishnu. OK, and now finally, well, not finally, Madhva's this is the last traditional commentator, and then we're going to get to Sri Ramakrishna. Madhva, third traditional commentator, he was the famous exponent of the Dvaita Vedanta school. It's, he didn't call it the Dvaita Vedanta school, so I prefer not to use that term. It means literally dualistic Vedanta. Um, he didn't use that term. Um, so I think a more neutral way to refer to his school is as Madhva Vedanta. It's just the school of Madhva. It's another bhakti school of Vedanta. And he agrees with Ramanuja that Brahman is personal Vishnu Narayana. It's Vishnu, so let's call him Vishnu. But there's an important difference. There are multi many important differences between Madhva's bhakti school of Vedanta and Ramanuja's. But one of the key differences, the one that's most relevant in our context, is that whereas Ramanuja claims that Brahman is both the instrumental cause of this world and the material cause, Madhva says that Brahman is the instrumental cause, but not the material cause of this world. OK. 
what is that? What's the logic behind that? The logic is exactly the worry I raised a couple of minutes ago about Ramanu's position. Madhva says, if, if Vishnu is taken to be the material cause of this world, Vishnu gets tainted with the evils of this world. That's the problem, with Brahman being the material cause. So we can't allow for Brahman to be the material cause, but it's the instrumental cause. That's no problem. The potter's not infected with the, with the, with the bad qualities in the, in the clay when he makes a pot out of it, right? So this is why Madhva says that Brahman is the instrumental cause, but not the material cause of this world, OK? So this is a third distinct answer to the question of the relationship between Brahman and the world. Now, coming back to Liza, uh, Lila, sorry, uh, Li Lila's point about you notice that there's that gold is a strikingly different metaphor in some ways from clay, for instance, because it's inherently valuable. Madhva makes heavy weather of this. He actually distinguishes. He says that each one of these metaphors is significant for different reasons. But all of them, lo and behold, are going to support his philosophy. Okay. First, the clay and clay pots. First metaphor. He says that you might, it might seem as if what this metaphor is getting at is that Brahman is a material cause of this world, but that's not what it's teaching. The real point of the clay in the pots metaphor is simply to say that this world is similar to Vishnu. How is it similar? In being as real as Vishnu. Just as Vishnu is real, this world is also real. Because Madhva agrees with Ramanuja that the world is real, unlike Shankara. Okay. So I, I hope you followed this. I mean, these, get, these interpretations get kind of uh, subtle, but this one is relatively easy. I'm not saying you have to agree with it. I'm just explaining what it is. The whole point of the clay and pot metaphor in the Upanishad is to teach that this world is similar to Vishnu in one respect. That respect is reality. Just as, just as Vishnu is real, this world is also real. So that's his interpretation of the clay and the pots metaphor. Second metaphor from the Upanishad, gold and golden ornaments. He says, there's a different purpose behind this. He says, this is to teach us, this metaphor teaches us that Vishnu is infinitely superior to the world. Just as Lila was saying that gold is more valuable than other things, right, like clay. He says, so let, let me read directly from Madhva's commentary. He says, the world, or, or let me read, okay. As by the knowledge of gold, one knows that everything made of iron is inferior to it. So by knowing the Lord Vishnu, it is at once known that he is superior to the world. Then he says, the similarity here consists between a superior and inferior. As gold is superior to iron, <clears throat> so the Lord is superior to the world. Okay. Now, one question you might ask is, well, okay, gold I get, but where's the iron? The iron comes in the next, the next mantra, but he's kind of reading it into the previous mantra to prove, it, to prove his interpretation. And then finally, the nail cutter analogy, which we haven't really discussed much, and we don't have much time, so I'm not going to discuss it in detail, but basically he interprets this in a third way. He says that just as by knowing one nail cutter, an iron nail cutter, you know all the attributes of all things made of iron. There's so many things that can be made of iron. Just by looking at one iron nail cutter, you learn a lot about the attributes of iron on a small scale, and then you can generalize it and say that, so this giant iron tank, for instance, will have the same attributes, but to a much greater degree. So Madhva says, the third illustration of a pair of, uh, uh, of, of nail, uh, uh, nail cutters shows that sometimes by knowing a small quantity, we can know by the law of analogy the attributes of that in which that substance exists in a large quantity. As by knowing a small quantity of iron, one knows the larger mass of iron. So by knowing human beings, as having a small quantity of happiness and sentience and consciousness, one knows the Lord, Vishnu, in whom these qualities exist in their infinity. So when we see human beings, and we see, well, yeah, these human beings are conscious, some of them at least seem quite happy, and uh, uh, what's the third one? Ha happiness, oh yeah, well, well, jnana. So sentiency, chit, and wisdom, okay? God, if we just multiply that by infinity, all these attributes of human beings, we end up with God's attributes. Wonderful, the omni-attributes of God. God is omnipotent. God is, 
the most conscious being in the world, God is all-knowing, Sarvagya, is omniscient, right? Okay, so now, I've given you a, a sort of whirlwind tour of three traditional interpretations of these mantras from the Chandogya Upanishad. Shankara's, Shankara says, again I'll repeat it, just so that it's drilled in your head. Shankara says that Ultimately, from the ultimate standpoint, Brahman is neither the instrumental cause of this world nor the material cause. Ramanuja says, wrong, Shankara. Brahman is both the material cause and the instrumental cause of the world. Madhva says, wrong, Shankara and Ramanuja. Brahman is only the instrumental cause of this world, but not the material cause. These are the three competing interpretations. So now, before we get into Sri Ramakrishna, let's briefly, I want to ask a question. Which, if any, of these three interpretations do you find most plausible, and why? Anyone brave enough? Yes, Giran. Uh, to me, it would be either Shankara's or Ramanujas. Okay, Just because, um, to me, then it would be like, OK, then what about like matter? Like, how do I get rid of, like, the problem of matter in my head? Like, uh, in the sense of, like, what happens to it? I don't know if, like, right. I'm and, making and, my and, point, and like... Because, yeah, well, I see what you're <laughs> saying. It's I kind mean, of like a... Because he, Madhva sort of uh, might be leaving the world hanging, in a sense, mm -hmm. because he's, he's, he's not accepting that Brahman is directly linked to the world as its material cause. And Shankara doesn't have that problem, presumably, because the world doesn't exist, yeah, yeah. fortunately, for Shankara. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, that's a nice point. Yeah, OK. So, so Kiran says either Shankara or Ramanuja, but not Madhva. Anyone else want to take a stab before we move on? One more person, if anyone wants to venture a second opinion. OK, so I'm not going to give mine yet. I may never give it. I want you guys to think for yourselves. But let's go on to Sri Ramakrishna's and explore how we can begin to follow Swami Vivekananda's advice, his explicit instructions to monks of the order about how to interpret the Vedantic scriptures. Let's try to study these same mantras from the standpoint of Sri Ramakrishna. Now, there's a question here. Which of these three traditional commentators, Shankara, Ramanuja, or Madhva, do you think that Sri Ramakrishna's view comes closest to? Shank so Sri Ramakrishna's understanding of Brahman in the world, the relation between Brahman and the world. Many of you have studied at least part of the gospel. That's why I'm, I'm presupposing some knowledge of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings here. If any of you among in the audience, if any of you are familiar with Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, especially his teachings on the relationship between Brahman and the world, which of the three do you think he comes closest to, or do you think he's, way, he's totally different from all three? Very good. So, yeah, you don't have to get, yeah, but that's a good, the one word answer is perfect for my purposes. Exactly. Out of the three, Sri Ramakrishna seems to come closest to Ramanuja's interpretation, that Brahman is both the material and the instrumental cause of this world. In fact, none other than Sri Ramakrishna said so. <laughs> It's another interesting thing, which many people don't know. Let me read to you from the Gospel, 11th March, 1885. Sri Ramakrishna tells a group of people, including Naren, the future Swami Vivekananda himself. Sri Ramakrishna says, in Vedanta, there is Shankara's Advaitic interpretation, and there's also Ramanuja's Vishishta Advaita interpretation. Narendra. What is Vishishta Advaita? And Sri Ramakrishna gives him a beautiful lesson in what is Vishishta Advaita Vedanta of Ramanuja. Listen, Sri Ramakrishna, oh, it's here, right? It's, an, it's, a, it's the first quotation on the second page of the handout. Sorry. <laughs> Vishishta Advaita is Ramanuja's doctrine. According to this view, Brahman is qualified by the universe and its living beings. These three, Brahman, the insentient world, and living beings, Together constitute one reality. Jeeb Jagod Bishishto Brahmo, Shab Jodiya Akti. So Advaita, because there's only one reality, which is God. But it's an all-encompassing Advaita. That one divine reality encompasses everything in this world. Hmm? Then Sri Ramakrishna says, take the instance of a bale fruit. So he's using his own metaphor now. To explain Ramanuja's philosophy, 
A man wanted to know the weight of the fruit. He separated the shell, the flesh, and the seeds. But can a man get the weight of the whole fruit by weighing only the flesh? He must weigh flesh, shell, and seeds together. At first, it appears that the real thing in the fruit is the flesh and not its seeds or shell. Then, by reasoning, you find that the shell, seeds, and flesh all belong to the fruit. The shell and seeds belong to the same thing that the flesh belongs to. Likewise, in spiritual discrimination, vichara, one must first reason, following the method of not this, not this, neti, neti. God is not the universe. God is not the living beings. Brahman alone is real. All else is unreal. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya, Shankara's view. Then one realizes, as with the bale fruit, that the reality from which we derive the notion of Brahman is the very reality from which come living beings and the universe. The nitya and the lila are the two aspects of one and the same reality. Therefore, Ramanuja held that Brahman is qualified by the universe and the living beings. This is called Vishishtadvaita. Then he says to M, I do see God directly. What shall I reason about? I clearly see. So he's not, you might say, well, he's just explaining Ramanuja's position. Then he says, I clearly see that she herself has become everything that she herself has become the universe and all living beings, Divine Mother herself. He's supporting Ramanuja's understanding of the relationship between Brahman and the world, that Brahman has become this world. In fact, in many places in the gospel, he says, the, the, the vigyani, the person who has this very unique kind of spiritual experience, vigyani dekhe, brahmoi chotur bingshi tatto haichen, that Brahman itself has become the 24 cosmic principles. So, now you might say, well, then now you're saying, Medananda is saying that uh, Sri Ramakrishna is a follower of Ramanuja. That's not what I'm saying. It's not what I'm saying. Why am I not saying that? I gave an entire class on this, by the way. You can look it up if you want. Is Sri Ramakrishna, or was Sri Ramakrishna a follower of Ramanuja? <laughs> so refer to that if you want, but uh, I'll give you the brief answer. The, the most fundamental difference philosophically between Ramanuja's philosophy and Sri Ramakrishna's is the following. According to Ramanuja, Brahman is only Saguna, only the personal God, Vishnu Narayana. Ramanuja does not accept the reality of non-dual pure consciousness. He does not accept the reality of Nirguna Brahman, which for Shankara is the only reality. So they're exact opposite positions, Shankara and Ramanuja here. According to Shankara, Brahman is only Nirguna, without attributes, impersonal, non-dual pure consciousness. According to Ramanuja, Brahman is only Vishnu, and not Nirguna Brahman. Now, what is Sri Ramakrishna's position? Anyone, quickly? What is Sri Ramakrishna's position? Exactly, very good. We have an expert in the gospel here in Sri Ramakrishna's teachings. Exactly, one of his famous, most famous teachings, Brahma Shokti Abhid. Brahman and Shakti are inseparable, like fire and its power to burn, Ugni Antardahika Shakti. Brahman here means Nirguna Brahman, non-dual pure consciousness. Shakti means the personal God who creates, preserves, and destroys this world. They are inseparable but equally real aspects of one and the same infinite divine reality. Ramanuja would never accept that position because he didn't accept the reality of non-dual pure consciousness. So now, that's why he's not a follower of Ramanuja, but he fully agrees with Ramanuja with respect to the relationship between Brahman and the world. Sri Ramakrishna will say, yes, Ramanuja, you're right that Brahman is both the instrumental and the material cause of this entire world. How do I know that? On the basis of my own spiritual experience, says Sri Ramakrishna. What are the names he gives to, to these spiritual experiences? The two key names. One is Jnana, the other is Vigyana. He explains both, and they're, they're sequential stages. Jnana is what he's explaining as Shankara's worldview. When you attain jnana, you attain the state of nirvikalpa samadhi, you merge your individuality and non-dual pure consciousness, like a salt doll merging into the ocean. And then if you come back from that state of samadhi, this whole world appears like a dream. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Then he says, but that's not the end of spiritual experience and spiritual life. He says there's a further stage of spiritual experience, which he calls vigyana. He says most people can't attain it. Usually only Ishvara Kotis, divinely commissioned souls, can attain it. But those who do, what a remarkable vision, how their vision is transformed. Instead of looking upon this world as unreal, they first attain the state of jnana, so they have all that the jnanis have. They attain the state of Nirvigopa Samadhi. They feel Brahma Satam Jagad Mithya. But then they come back to this world, and instead of seeing this world as a dream, they realize two things. Number one, Vigyani Dake, Jini Nirgun Tini Shogun. The Vigyani realizes that that reality, that divine reality, which is impersonal and attributeless, 
is at the same time the personal god, Shakti, Saguna. Secondly, the Vigyani realizes that this world isn't a dream. It's a real manifestation of God. The, the Vigyani sees that Brahman has become the 24 cosmic principles. Okay? So now, coming back to, now let's try to situate Sri Ramakrishna vis-a-vis -vis Shankara and Ramanuja. He beautifully harmonizes both of their philosophies by saying that Shankara's Advaita Vedanta corresponds to the jnana stage of spiritual experience, which he directly experienced under Totapuri and, and subsequently. But then he says, Ramanuja's philosophy corresponds to the further vijnana stage of spiritual experience, beyond jnana, where you realize, the vijnana realizes that the ultimate reality is both nirguna and saguna, and that Brahman has become everything in this world. Now then you might say, but wait a minute, Ramanuja doesn't accept Brahman as nirguna, which is correct. That's why Sri Ramakrishna is not a follower of Ramanuja. That's why Sri Ramakrishna is pointing out a deep similarity between the Vigyani's vision of the world and the Ramanujites' vision of the world. But he's not equating Vigyana Vedanta, which is his own philosophy, with Ramanuja's Vishtadvaita Vedanta. Because Ramanuja, Ramanuja does not accept the impersonal, non-dual pure consciousness at all, whereas Sri Ramakrishna fully does. So Ramanuja wouldn't even accept the Jnana stage let alone the Vigyana stage, which is supposed to come after Jnana. You see how there are key differences between Sri Ramakrishna and Ramanuja. At the same time, there's a deep similarity with respect to their understanding of the relationship between Brahman and the world. Okay. Now, you might ask, well, so now let's compare. Now, if we've narrowed it down to two choices, we have either, we have Sri Ramakrishna's approach to the scriptures and we have Ramanuja's. Which one is better and why? First of all, in the case of the question of what is the nature of ultimate reality, is it only personal, like Ramanuja says, or is it both? If you look at the Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita, you'll find that there are many mantras talking about God as personal, and there are many mantras talking about God as impersonal. I'll give you one example of many. Shweta Ashwatara Upanishad, 6.11. Eko Devaha Sarvabhuteshu Gudaha. So here, it's the personal God who's the antaryami, who is the inner controller in all of us, which means the personal God. Sarvavyapi, omnipresent, sarvabhuta antaratma, dwelling in all beings. Karma dhyakshaha, the dispenser of all the fruits of all karmas, all of our karma, he's the one, God is the one who distributes fruits to everybody, the fruits of our karma. Sarvabhuta divasaha, who dwells in, every, in, in, in everyone. Sakshi, now we get into Advaita, Sakshi is the witness. That same Brahman is, is, is the unaffected witness. Cheta, that which imparts consciousness to all sentient beings. Again, we get more like Advaita. And then the most direct link with Shankara's philosophy, Kevalo Nirgunascha. It's also Nirguna Brahman. The term is used that Advaitans are fond of using, Nirguna. So Brahman is both Nirguna and Saguna. And so that lends itself better, arguably, to Sri Ramakrishna's interpretation, which is that the Vigyani sees that the reality is, that reality which is Nirguna is also Saguna. We find it again and again. I just gave you one example, but there are many examples of this. Okay, so now, we've sort of like uh, drifted a bit from the, the metaphors, so let me come back to the metaphors. Clay in pots, golden ornaments, right? Sri Ramakrishna, he has his own metaphors. He doesn't say clay in pots in this context, but he was very fond of uh, another metaphor, which is a metaphor of wax. And I'll, this is another statement that he makes in, recorded in the gospel. He says, the bhakta, the devotee of the personal God, also has a realization of advaita, of oneness, ekatva actually, ekakar. He has a realization of oneness also. He sees that there's nothing but God. Instead of saying that the world is unreal like a dream, he says that God has become everything. In a wax garden, everything is wax, but in various forms. In a wax garden, everything is wax, but in various forms. Mumir bagane shabi mom tobe nana rup. Now notice the parallels with how this could help us to interpret the clay in the pots in Shandogi Upanishad, the gold in the ornaments. Everything is made of clay. But that doesn't mean that these forms of clay, the different formations of clay are unreal. They're perfectly real. 
perfectly real but temporary manifestations of Brahman. And just as the different ornaments of gold, the earrings, the necklace, are nothing but real but temporary formations of the gold. He used the metaphor of wax here, and he says, imagine there's nothing but wax. And there are wax trees in a wax garden, right? So there's a wax garden. So there are wax trees. It's like, what's our Ripley's Believe It or Not or something? But what's the famous Madame Tussauds in England, in London, right? Yeah. So like that, everything. And they seem so lifelike. Actually, but they're, they're nothing but wax, he says, which means they're nothing but Brahman. But that doesn't make those manifestations unreal. They're fully real as Brahman, but they're real formations of Brahman, real manifestations of Brahman. In fact, M asks Sri Ramakrishna once, is the universe unreal? And I have a separate class on this, but I just want to read you uh, his answer here to remind you of it. 16th December, 1883. He answers M as follows. Why should the universe be unreal? That is how the Advaitic jnanis reason. That's how followers of Shankara reason. He says it explicitly here. He doesn't use the word Shankara, but he says Advaitic jnanis. After realizing God, one sees that it is God herself who has become the universe and all living beings. And then he talks about his own spiritual experience of Vigyana. The Divine Mother revealed to me in the Kali Temple that it was she who had become everything. She showed me that everything was divine consciousness, Shab Chinmoy. The image was consciousness. The altar was consciousness. The water vessels were consciousness. Kosha Kushi Chinmoy. The door sill was consciousness. The marble floor was consciousness. All was consciousness. Even the cat was consciousness. I mean, he's giving this very beautiful description of his own experience of Vigyana here. Then, so now, same thing. Notice, do you, is it plausible to interpret his spiritual experience as he realized that Brahman alone is real and that all this, this entire world of names and forms is unreal. Or is he realizing that the, because he's doing puja, remember, that's a, it's, it, at, on the occasion of a spiritual experience, he's doing puja, he's doing worship, ritualistic worship. Every single instrument he's using, he sees as nothing but Divine Mother. The door sill he glances at is nothing but Divine Mother. The cat who walks into the room is nothing but Divine Mother. Which means all of these different names and forms are real manifestations of Brahman. Real manifestations of God. Among the direct disciples, Swami Turiyanji had a, one of the most profound and I would say deepest understandings of Sri Ramakrishna's unique philosophy of Vigyana Vedanta, in my view. And his last words were Brahma Satyam Jagat. Anyone? Satyam. She's, she's on a roll today. So are you. Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam. Reversal of Shankara. This world is real. Brahman is real. But that doesn't make the world unreal. The world is also real as a manifestation of Brahman. And if you say, well, that can be interpreted in different ways, maybe he means the same thing as Shankara, but he's just putting, putting it in a different way. No. And the reason is because he wrote an entire lengthy letter in Bengali, which has been translated into English by Chetananji, and which I've also retranslated. You can look at that class, which I gave a few months ago, called Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam, Swami Turiyananji's letter on Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy. And in the handout, which is, there's a link to the handout in the YouTube description, it has my translation of his letter. I want to read you just two things. First, the context of this letter is, Swami Sharvanandaji, another monk of our order, writes to Turiyananji with a doubt. He says, well, when I read Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, I find that he's teaching that everything is Brahman, that the personal God is also real. But I, I've studied Shankara really carefully. Shankara doesn't seem to teach that. Shankara teaches Vivartavada, that this world is an illusory appearance of Brahman. So now, and, and then Charvanandaji says, so I can't explain Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual experience of Vigyana. How can the puja vessels be Brahman? That doesn't make sense. How can the cat be Brahman? The substratum of the cat can be Brahman. The substratum of the puja vessels can be Brahman, but not the vessel itself, not the cat itself. Turiyanji says, wrong says, let me read directly from the letter, so why can't the worship vessels be manifestations of divine consciousness? There's nothing except God. Everything without exception is God. We see other things precisely because we do not see God. But when we do see God, then we find that God alone 
is everything. And he says in that same letter, so the key question is, what is the status of, the, of all these names and forms we're seeing around us, real or unreal? And what is the relationship between Brahman and these names and forms? So he says, Turianji says, explaining Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy, names and forms come from the divine and abide in the divine. Now notice, Turianji's, Sri Ramakrishna used the metaphor of wax. Turianji is using his own metaphors. Waves, foam, bubbles, these are all nothing but water. Clay pots, nothing but clay. Golden ornaments, nothing but gold. Wax uh, trees and plants, nothing but wax. Tunianji, waves, foam, bubbles, these are all nothing but water. In light of this truth, I don't care whether your Vivartavada stands or falls. I don't care whether your Vivartavada stands or falls. Sharvanandaji was a follower of Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. So a believer in this Vivartavada doctrine, this world is an illusory appearance of, of Brahman, like the snake is an illusory appearance of the rope. He says, I don't care if what I just explained to you as Sri Ramakrishna's position agrees or disagrees with Shankara's view. Then Turianji says, one who has seen this truth cannot say that this world is unreal. So I don't know if he can be any more emphatic than that. And notice the metaphors here. Just as all the different things made of wax in Sri Ramakrishna's analogy are, are real wax formations. Just as different things formed out of clay are real clay formations. Just as different ornaments formed out of gold are real ornaments made of gold. Just so, does it make sense to say that the, a wave in an ocean is an illusory appearance of the ocean? Does it make sense, sense to say that the foam on, uh, 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 sort of on surface, resting on the surface of an ocean is an, is an illusory appearance of the ocean? No, they're re fully real manifestations. Temporary, but fully real manifestations of Brahman. So, d uh, this was, uh, I don't know if I went too fast, uh, but maybe, and especially for people online, but it'll be on YouTube. And uh, there's, a, there's always that function where you can slow down the speed. <laughs> Some people do that, because they tend to speak quickly. So they watch it at like 0.75 rather than at one. Um, OK, so in any case, we can go on and discuss other interpretations. But I just wanted to give you a taste of how we might begin to carry out Swami Vivekananda's very, very important project of reinterpreting the Vedantic scriptures in the light of the life and teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. The work is just beginning, and it's very exciting work. And uh, thank you for joining me in the project. Questions? I have a question about yeah, but first the microphone. Thank you. I have a question about consciousness because yeah. um, a lot of people know, like my brother got a heart attack. You know, you lost conscious, uh, you know, for certain uh, minutes. And, and even when we talk about spirituality, it's about also consciousness, even with God uh, existing. Um, so how to con can you put the mic closer? To your, sometimes how, online people complain that they uh, can't hear the questioners properly. So, how yeah. to connect yourself with your own consciousness or with others' consciousness? Well, there's only one consciousness ultimately. It's divine consciousness, and that one divine consciousness has playfully manifested as all of our individual consciousnesses. So we're all connected as God as divine consciousness. So that would be the short answer. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, and Sri Ramakrishna, he also stated that Rama, who was once born as Rama and once who was born as Krishna, is now Ramakrishna, here. In Ramakrishna. Yeah. So does that also, you know, solidifies his point uh, that Brahman has taken a human form uh, and also oh, instrumental as well as the material cause. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, th th that's actually the doctrine of avatara, of incarnation, divine incarnation. Um, and it's related, um, and I think it's, it's certainly in line with what I've been saying, uh, because ultimately Shankara will have to say that incarnations are also non-existent. Because if all human beings are non-existent and God incarnates in the form of a human being, that means that even incarnations are ultimately non-existent. 
because Brahma never actually transforms into anything or anyone, right? Uh, so yeah, I think it lends itself to it, but Sri Ramakrishna's claim is even more radical. It's not just God becomes certain privileged human beings like Rama and Krishna and Ramakrishna, but that chair, that pillow, the light, literally everything without exception, nothing but God, good and bad, good, the bad, the ugly, everything is God. That seems to be Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta position. Yeah, any other questions? Thank you. And any online questions, Kenny, by the way? Oh, six or seven. OK. You want to pick a couple, triage, and just? Well, um, there were several, actually, there was like a discussion going mm. on. OK, we don't want the discussion, but just an actual but question to me. If, with, well. <laughs> if there are any out of the six. I'm not really sure. OK. Uh, oh, yeah, I should be the one looking through them, but I, I forgot to do it this time. Well, I can't read them while you're talking. My brain only does channel well, one no, go or, ahead and read or it the now. other. Now you're talking. But put the <laughs> mic in front of your mouth so that people can hear you. OK. Doesn't, oh, uh, no, that's not a good one. That's related to all the discussion. Um, OK, thank you. All right, let me see here. Here we go. Oh, comments, comments. They're having interesting discussions, but I'm trying to see what the, oh, whoa. OK, hold on. That gets weird, because it's, I push playbacks in. OK, question. Here's a question from Jill. How does Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy deal with the problem of the divine being contaminated with the unsavory aspects of the world? Excellent question. Um, and the reason why the question is so good is because I already raised the question in the context of Ramanuja and Madhva and Shankara. Shankara avoids the problem altogether. Why? Because there's no world. <laughs> so God can't be contaminated with the evils of the world if there's no world. Ramanuja is the one who's in most trouble in a way. Madhva is in less trouble because he doesn't accept that Brahman is the material cause. But any, anyone who accepts that Brahman is the material cause and the instrumental cause of the world has to answer this question. And so, now, my, now I'm hearing my voice over there. Okay, okay, now it's fine, okay. And that's really bewildering to hear myself at the same time. Okay, so, uh, and now your phone is, okay. So now, how does Sri Ramakrishna answer the question? First of all, he bites the bullet. And he says, for instance, Divine Mother has become both Avidya Maya and Vidya Maya. Not just the maya of knowledge, which means all the wonderful spiritual qualities that we see in great saints like bhakti and jnana and viveka and vairagya and all these wonderful things. No, God has also become avidya maya. He says it clearly. Lust, greed, all the six enemies in spiritual life, all these things. Hmm? And then there's a question of, well, doesn't that implicate God in the evil? There's no short answer to this question. And so I would refer you to... Uh, Two chapters of my, of, of my book, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, chapter seven and eight, are on the problem of evil. And I discuss this in detail. And it's difficult to kind of give a, a brief explanation of this. Um, but the basic idea is, the question itself assumes some kind of dualism between God on the one hand and evil on the other or God and his creatures, God on the one hand and God's creatures on the other hand. But there's always some kind of distinction made. And Sri Ramakrishna's basic standpoint, from the, from the spiritual standpoint of Vigyana, there's no duality at all. There is no distinction between God and his creatures. There's no distinction between God and the evil that we see in, the, in this world. We say evil from our human standpoints. But when we inhabit God's standpoint, one sees nothing but God. What's a concrete example of this in Sri Ramakrishna's own life? There's a very beautiful incident. When Sri Ramakrishna sees a wounded butterfly, a butterfly with a kind of splinter in one of its wings, and he feels terrible pain and sympathy for this butterfly. And he just thinks to himself, what cruel child must have stabbed this butterfly with, with the splinter and making this poor butterfly suffer? What happens next? Sri Ramakrishna flies into a state of spiritual ecstasy. Vigyana. And then he says, then I, I started laughing. 
like a crazy person because I realized that divine mother, that butterfly is the divine mother, the splinter is the divine mother, and the boy inflicting that terrible suffering on the, on the butterfly is divine mother too. It's divine mother playing with herself, I mean, in, in all these different ways, in all these different forms. So anyway, I, I can't go into more details than that, but that's the kind of, um, the basic thrust of Sri Ramakrishna's answer, or, or a Ramakrishna answer to this problem of um, how is God not implicated in the evil. And if you want details, chapter seven and eight of Infinite Past to Infinite Reality. And uh, any other, I think that might be the only question, question. Okay, there's one more. Vishwa, question. Isn't Sri Ramakrishna's Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam contradict with, okay, I'm gonna fix the English here, no offense, but uh, doesn't Sri Ramakrishna's Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam contradict Swami Vivekananda's there is no world, only Brahman? Why is there such a difference between guru and disciple? Another excellent question, another massive question. And the answer to that is my latest book, published last year, called Swami Vivekananda's Vedanta Cosmopolitanism. So read that book if you are interested. Um, but again, I'll, I'll give you a brief gist of um, my main line of argument, which is that contrary to what many people think when they study the life of Swami Vivekananda Naren at the time when he was visiting Sri Ramakrishna, he was Naren, and how he was groomed by Sri Ramakrishna. Most people seem to think that Sri Ramakrishna moved him away from the Brahma Samaj philosophy, which is belief in a formless but personal God, Nirakara Saguna Brahman, and, and made him accept Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. How do we know this? What evidence do these people give? Well, because he had him read out loud from Ashtavakar Samhita, one of the most hardcore texts of Advaita Vedanta in Shankara's school. And the fact that, among other pieces of evidence, that on one of his first encounters with Naren in Dukkineshur, he touches Naren on the chest, and what happens? He sends him into the state of Nirvigapa Samadhi, where he realizes Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Okay, and there are other reasons why many people think that. But my argument in, in the first chapter of this book, Swami Vivekananda's Vedanta Cosmopolitanism, is that actually Sri Ramakrishna grooms his disciple, the future Swami Vivekananda, in two phases. In the first phase, he weans Swami Vivekananda away from the Brahma Samaj philosophy and toward Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, this world-denying Advaita Vedanta of Shankara, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. But there's a second phase which I think many people have overlooked. This is from 1884 to 1886. When Sri Ramakrishna, remember that the passage that I read to you on the second page of the handout about Vishita Advaita and Naran Asim? Where, where is that from? 11th March, 1885, from the second phase. See how he's grooming, he's moving Swami Vivekananda, the future Swami Vivekananda, away from Shankara's world-denying standpoint and toward the Vigyana Vedanta standpoint, that this world is nothing but God. Another strong piece of evidence in favor of my interpretation is the Banyan tree incident. Swami Vivekananda, toward the end of his life, uh, toward the end of Sri Ramakrishna's life, comes to Sri Ramakrishna and says, I, please bless me so that I'm just immersed in the state of Nirvigapa Samadhi. I completely forget about this world. Come down once in a while just to have a few morsels of food, a little bit of milk, and then I want to go back in, into Samadhi. Shankar gives him a severe scolding. He says, shame on you. I thought you would be like a great banyan tree giving shelter to thousands. Now I see you're selfish. You only care about your own salvation. Aren't you the one who sings? Oh Lord, thou art all that exists. You're, you're, you think so, so little of yourself. You think you're a jnani? You want nothing? Uh, jnana is a, a trivial achievement for you. You are a vigyani. You are here not because of your own karma, but to help others. And you can only do that as a vigyani. So you should see everything as God. That's the, that's the much greater and higher standpoint. He says, that is the higher standpoint, uchu uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a higher standpoint than jnana, and it's called vigyana. So anyway, so this second phase of grooming is what I think is neglected by many people. And then chapter two of my book, I, 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 I show how what might seem to be like Shankarite teachings, teachings that come very close to Shankara's in the complete works of Swami Vivekananda. If you read between the lines and you study what he says in context, you're gonna find that his teachings come much closer to Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta. Or at least I find that and then that's up to you. First read the book and then if you wanna disagree with me, feel free to. What happens usually is that they don't read what I've written and they disagree with me without knowing what my position is and that's irritating. Okay, any other questions? Uh, well, okay, I'm gonna ask myself then. I think we're good now. Uh, yes. Well, 
Sadequa Sadequa asks, we human beings can feel we are all part of one Brahman, but all ornaments can feel they are all part of one gold. We human beings can feel. Oh, I see. So, so she's, she's raising the doubt that clay and gold are insentient, whereas we are sentient. So we can feel ourselves as part of Brahman or one with Brahman, but a, a clay pot can never feel that it's one with clay. That's true, I agree, but I, I, without more development of what your question is, it's hard for me to, I mean, is it an objection? Um, because I don't think that it's a cogent one as an objection. Um, yeah, because nobody's claiming, the Upanishad is not claiming that clay is capable of spiritual experiences, but it's a metaphor to explain that Brahman is, Brahman actually transforms into this world. Okay. Oh, I see. Jill is reminding me that she has another question above under question, seeming weakness in Shankara's philosophy. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Okay, here we go. Jill asks another question. Do you think that there's a logical trickery? And this is my last answer. Last question, last answer. Do you think there's a logical trickery in Shankara's assertion that there's only one unchanging substance and that the world neither exists nor does not exist? That's two types of stuff. Uh, okay, so the thing is, that's a good question. It's a subtle kind of almost technical question about Shankara's school of Advaita Vedanta. But the thing is, I have to give an equally technical answer, or at least begin to, which is that Shankara actually very rarely, if ever, says that the world neither exists nor does not exist. That actually is more, that's a more common position in post-Shankara Advaita Vedanta. Sadasadhyama Nirvachaniya. Like, if you study the text Vedanta Sara, for instance, that's a medieval Advaitic text, not Shankara's. It's a follower of Shankara who will say these things. And that Maya is neither quite real nor quite unreal. It has this kind of intermediate state of existence. Shankara, now, does he accept that or not? It's a very, very complicated scholarly question. My own view is that he doesn't, and that at the end of the day, he says that from the ultimate standpoint, this world is actually unreal. Um, so, and I think he's pretty consistent about it, actually. That, at, it, exactly like the rope and the snake. At the end of the day, there's only rope, no snake. Same way, likewise, at the end of the day, there's only Brahman, no world, no personal God, no individual souls. Thank you so much. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Paramastu